Now we're going to switch to a live video feed now from New York and I'm pleased to uh, welcome John T. Kelt of Group Commerce uh, who's, who's going to be uh, our keynote speaker going forward. Here's John T. Welcome John T. John T. is CEO and co-founder of Group Commerce, a technology business that helps media companies enter the world of e-commerce. They've developed a white label software platform that helps audience owners like the New York Times and Parents Magazine match their content with related product and service offerings without tarnishing their brand. Group Commerce has enjoyed 30% growth in month-to-month -month revenues in the past year and recently announced that it has raised $21 million in new funding, which will be used to expand their European footprint. Before founding Group Commerce in 2010, Jaunty was the co-founder of Europe's first internet affiliate network and led double-click search technology and services business in both Europe and Asia through their acquisition by Google. He is from Hawke's Bay originally and holds a bachelor's degree from Otago University. Today, Jaunty is going to speak from personal experience on the steps involved with going from startup to global and the transition in skills and approach that that requires. Please join me in welcoming Jaunty. Thank you very much, Phil and Ben. Um, from a balmy fall evening in a very tall building in downtown New York City. I'm uh, very privileged to speak to you all today. Uh, very happy to be able to contribute in some way to the emerging startup tech scene, which sounds fantastic in the Christchurch area. And also, uh, happy birthday, 10th anniversary, that's, that's fantastic. I share with many of you in the room, if not all of you in the room, a vision for New Zealand being a very important part of the global tech economy. I believe that New Zealanders have an entrepreneurial flair and an innovativeness, which bodes well for you know, entrepreneurialism and startup in the tech economy. And I also believe that New Zealand and the technology industry does not suffer from the tyranny of distance, unlike other industries. So I'm pretty excited about um, what's going on in New Zealand and want to share some of my experiences, which have been in the global setting in the last 12 or so years. Uh, so maybe, maybe they'll be helpful for you as you're considering how you're going to proceed with your business. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in a farming setting. Uh, chasing a lot of sheep, um, doing every farm job you can imagine um, in the King Country and Hawke's Bay. I was educated at Otago University, um, which I really much enjoyed, and uh, actually started my career in banking. But it was only a few years in banking before I realized that I uh, was probably not going to make a huge difference in a 100-year-old industry with a lot, pe a lot of people that had a lot more experience in that business than I did. And the internet and the technology sector caught my eye. And so I went to the UK, as many Kiwis do, for a short period of time at least, and uh, I started a technology business. That was 1999. It was Europe's first affiliate network in the uh, heady days of the dot-com boom. And anything was possible, and very quickly we, we grew um, what was a, a meaningful company. Um, unfortunately, um, due in part to market forces and uh, naivety um, on our part, you know, we didn't make it through the uh, dot-com bust. But what an experience, and I certainly caught the bug about what was possible in the technology market, not to mention being an entrepreneur. Um, from there, I actually went to China and started or co-founded a um, sports and entertainment business, bringing Broadway musicals and pop concerts and creating sports events um, from the, the Western markets into the emerging Chinese market. Um, that was a fantastic experience. Again, lots of learnings uh, about how to grow and build a company. Um, and ultimately, um, I would say it was an okay uh, result in terms of um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the result of the business. But I wanted to get back to technology and I wanted to get back to the Western markets. And um, I set up a business for an American company in uh, London, uh, an internet marketing service, again, a technology business participating in the search market. And that ultimately was, um, over a period of five years, acquired three times, ultimately by Google, um, and, and was a fantastic experience and ultimately a result. Um, from there, I, I've moved to uh, New York City, where I, where I currently live. I've been here about three years, and 
And uh, soon after I got to New York City, I, I started my fourth startup experience. Um, and it's TBD in terms of um, a result, but so far so good, and, uh, and, and certainly has contributed to my uh, little graph on the right-hand side there, which is really just what success looks like in the startup world, if you could uh, go to that. You know, when you start a business, you, of course, hope it's all up and to the right in a nice, linear, organized fashion. Um, but, of course, the reality is that it's a squiggly line, and it goes all over the place, and you better be ready for some surprises and some hardships as you go. Um, but ultimately, if you have tenacity and faith and good vision and good team around you, you, know, you will make it in the end. Um, so if we go to the next slide, just a, li a little more about uh, Group Commerce, the company I'm working on at the moment, I think was well introduced. You know, we're trying to help media companies and publishers survive and prosper in a digital world by helping them to participate in these huge e-commerce markets. E-commerce is not something they've previously done, uh, but we believe they should. They've got the brand, they've got the audiences, they've got great content, and in a digital world, everything's possible and all the old rules go out the window. So that's what we're trying to do with Group Commerce. It's a technology business. We have a services stack as well. And we're making some pretty good, pretty good progress there. We've got some, some good clients and, and you know, we're expanding into uh, the European market via the UK. Um, so the squiggly line of Group Commerce is underway. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the little circle over on the right-hand side. You'll see there's a, a lot of names in there. They're the largest and best known uh, media companies in the world, Disney, Comcast, News Corp, etc. Um, they still are powerful companies, huge audiences, great content, um, but they're worth about a third in market cap terms of some of the new media companies, the digital companies. And that just instructs and, and, and sort of points out that tech-enabled businesses really are taking over the world. The circle on the right is grappling with this transition. Group Commerce is trying to help them with the transition by providing one part of the equation. We think e-commerce is something they should be doing. Um, but it's open green fields and, and never has there been a more exciting time to be an entrepreneur in the world. I'm sure that when oil was discovered, the railways were invented, cars were invented, TV was invented, the radio was invented. You know, they were exciting times, but those times pale in comparison to what we're experiencing right now, not just with the internet, but with the mobile device, the social graph, and many other things, and particularly software as a service and cloud-based computing. That really is why New Zealand does not suffer from the tyranny of distance. So what is a startup? Going to the next slide. To my mind, it solves a worthwhile problem. If you're not solving a problem, no one's going to care. Your business isn't going to work. So the search for a scalable, repeatable business model, which has margin, quite important, and solves a problem, is what a startup is all about. And a startup really finishes as it starts. The squiggly line would suggest that. It's also a journey in uncertainty, in human relations, and excitement and fear. For those of you who are entrepreneurs in the room, you will wake up, I'm sure, like me, in the middle of the night, in a cold sweat about some aspect of the business. But you will also have those high moments where you get the first customer, you make that great hire, you raise that funding, and you start to see a business model evolving around solving that particular problem. It's an intense and humbling experience. Every day I'm humbled by something, and uh, I never believe that I have it all right. Um, but if you have an open mind and you're ready to take on the challenge and trust your gut and your judgment and get a good team around you, you know, I have proven to myself that it can be done. And I'm sure some of you in the room there know as well. So going to the next slide, what's required? I like to keep things simple. I think there's three things to creating a, a great startup um, or any business for that matter. The first is the market. How big is it? It better be big because Otherwise, you're kind of wasting your time and wasting your investors' time. And the problem better be real, and people better care about the problem. So that's the first thing. The second is execution. To my mind, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a little biased, but it's very clear this is the hardest part. That squiggly line and that journey is, is incredibly intense. And you're not going to do it on your own. You're going to need to build a great team around you who have multiple skills and multiple viewpoints to chase that vision. 
And then last is funding. It's an important part of the equation. And I'm going to talk to each of those three things, just give you my thoughts on kind of how I think about them. Um, but I would point out that when you're talking to an investor, what they really care about are the first two things. The market and the problem, is it big enough and is, do people care about the problem? And who's your team? Are these people going to be able to pull it off, including yourself? So going to the uh, next slide there, the, in terms of the market and the problem, you know, I like to think about two types of, of problem. Firstly, there is an established problem, an established category, which you're going to do better with better technology, a better approach, a better business model. And I think a good example of that is Wikipedia. Apparently, Encyclopedia Britannica was the old version of getting information. Wikipedia is the new version. Apparently, Apple is the new version of mobile or telephony overall, and they've taken it to new lengths with including many other things in there that we didn't realize we could get into a phone. So, you know, a great business can be made from enhancing or dramatically improving a existing problem by providing a better solution. The second is a brand new category, a paradigm shift. These are harder to, of course, come up with. Um, there aren't very many brand new things. Most things, in my mind, most ideas are ideas on ideas, innovations on innovations. And I think that's absolutely fine too, as long as you're providing value and, and, and improving people's lives or businesses' lives. Um, but the brand new category, of course, would be a Google. You know, I used to ask my friends or my parents if I needed advice on something. Now I just ask Google. We all do it every day. It's incredible. Um, who would have thought that you could sell all your old stuff and now buy anything new through an online interface? Call it eBay. Call it Amazon. ICQ, instant messaging. I think you all probably use that quite a lot. The ICQ was the first, one of the first um, iterations of, of instant messaging. Of course, there's been a, a lot of innovation on that with Skype and, and voice and video over the Internet, etc. But anyway, established categories and new categories. In terms of new categories, just a couple of thoughts I've got if you really want to shake up the world. Um, why not get rid of email hell? We spend way too much time doing that. Uh, why not solve typing? I don't think our fingers were made for typing. I'd quite like to give that up. I'm not sure about you. Um, what about electrical plugs? Aren't they painful? How about remote wireless electricity? Uh, how about physical universities? I mean, I enjoyed my time at Otago University. It was very social, but I'm not sure I really needed to be there in person to actually get an education. Um, money, physical money. What a crazy concept. Um, physical medical records. You know, these are some areas which will create new categories, and maybe some of you are already working on some of those. If we go to the next slide, talk about execution, as I say, I, I believe this is the hardest part. Um, it requires an incredible dance of teamwork, of execution, experience, passion, expertise, of skills coming together, of motivation, of tenacity. And those skills evolve as the business grows. In the early days, you need people who can lend an arm to anything, knock down walls to get anything done. And those people are invaluable in a startup context. But as your business matures, those people are going to be replaced by people who understand how to scale a business, how to apply process to a business so that it can repeat its business model and ultimately become a profitable and repeatable business. The mixture of the two is what you try to achieve, but the, the skill sets do, do evolve. I believe values are at the heart of any great team. The best people, in my experience, want to work in a context of honesty, Respect, uh, empathy, teamwork, professionalism, and the bedrock of any good team are those values and others that you can probably think of. Um, on top of that, you will attract good, good people with the talent that you're looking for and the expertise that, that you're looking for. And that's why, you know, when you're hiring, the instinct should be no, you're not right. You should only hire that person when you walk out of the room with a smile on your face saying, that person is awesome, I've got to hire them. And when you get a nagging feeling about one of your team members that they're not quite right, don't compromise, toss the bad apple because it will be a bad thing for the company to hold on to that person for any longer than is necessary. This may sound hard, 
but I've learned many times, and some of you would have, I'm sure, as well, that you've got to be true to the values and, and the quality of your team. Going to uh, the next slide there. Um, first of all, you'll see the guy licking a cactus. The point there is that you probably only do that once. I would hope you only do that once. But it's okay to make mistakes. Maybe licking a cactus is a really dumb mistake. So you're probably not going to do that. But I say to my team as often as I can that you should be making mistakes because if you're not, then you're not actually learning and by definition our company is not progressing. A startup is a journey of mistakes. And that's a very important kind of philosophy I hold. And within that, you know, execution is about motivating humans. Um, vision is a very powerful thing. People will follow a strong vision and the best people, they just want to know where they're going and they want to know there's great values in the organization. And then you unleash them with certain objectives and, and they'll work out how to get there. And the team will help them get there, which means empowerment. You know, a command and control <laughs> approach, an autocratic approach in a startup or any tech company or any business for that matter in my mind, but certainly an early stage business is, is not the way forward. You know, you have to empower people. So learning, iteration, measurement, a very important topic uh, here. You know, at every data point, qualitative and quantitative, get, makes you smarter and you need to be leveraging those. So let's move from execution to funding. You've identified the market and the problem. You've got a team around you. What about funding? It's a necessary part. It also can be very distracting. The goal here is to spend as little time as possible on funding, but make sure you've got enough cash to get to your next milestones. Don't spend any more time on it because it ultimately ain't the thing that's adding the value. Building that product, building that team is where you should spend your mind. Um, but it's, it is important. And, and so moving to, you know, just a little kind of straw man, if you like, on, you know, when to take investment. If we go to that next slide there. Um, this is just, you know, a, a sort of a journey that one startup might take. Imagine it's a software as a service technology business and they've got a great vision and they've got a problem they want to solve. Initially, they're going to need some funding because they're going to need a small team. Call it five people. So they've raised some money from friends and family. Call it a half a million dollars. It may be less than that, but it gets them to the initial milestones. They're exploring a product market fit. They are getting a prototype out there. And maybe they've got one or two beta customers. With that funding and over that first nine to 12 months, let's say, they get confidence that this business has legs. And so they want to go and raise some additional funding so that they can take it to the next milestones, which would be initial revenues, case studies from initial clients, and refining the business model and the product market fit. Let's imagine that that was a million dollars. It's a pretty solid angel round. I think it's seven hundred five to 700,000 is about the average angel round in New Zealand right now. And that gets you eight to 10 staff for another 12 months. And let's imagine you gave away 25% of the company, so that was a $4 million post-money valuation. And then let's say that you're feeling great about the business. It's time to find more customers and to accelerate things, to add salespeople, add some operation staff, add some sales people, and expand to maybe a larger market. You're going to need more money. That could be your Series A. That might be $5 million for another 25% of the business. That's a $10 million post-money valuation. So what I've outlined there is just one journey. It might be something close to the average. It's obviously a successful journey. But in, in outcomes there, you've raised $6.5 million. You've diluted by 75%. You own 25% of a company that's actually a business on its way to being a business. That's a pretty good result. Of course, some people do it for less dilution, others for more dilution. Um, and it took you about two years to get to that pre-Series A time. You know, that's a, that's a pretty kind of standard um, trajectory that I see here in the U.S. market. In the New Zealand market, of course, the capital markets are evolving, as is the tech, technology sector, but, you know, maybe that's helpful. Um, one rule of thumb here, particularly if it's a B2C application, is that you have to bootstrap for as long as possible. Raising money means you're tempted to spend more money. So not having much money instills a lot of discipline 
And that's what boot, bootstrapping is all about. It also has the benefit of uh, minimizing dilution. If you're trying to do a B2B play, you may, you may need a little more capital. The capital investment in a B2B play, especially if it's a, a software that a third party, a business is going to use for their um, you know, mission critical business applications, you're probably going to need more money up front. It might take a little longer. But anyway, hopefully that's helpful about when to take investment. If we go to the next slide there, um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This, this will be available afterwards, but I just wanted to talk about the funding process. In my experience, it takes about 12 to 16 weeks, that's three to four months to, from start to finish of a funding process. Um, that's first meeting with an investor after you've done some prep work through to actually closing, money hitting the bank account. There's many presentations, there's term sheet negotiation, and between that there's actual uh, due diligence and, and, and final definitive documentation negotiation, but that's about the process. You've got an investor package, which includes many things you can see up there on the, uh, on the um, projector, and the outcome is going to be evaluation and, and hopefully a, a raise. The valuation is a function of the targeted raise ownership and stake stage. As I, as I showed to you before, at each stage you might give away 25% of the company. It depends. Uh, more than one investor and more than one term sheet gives you leverage, obviously. And you're going to end up with some terms. Preferred equity security, board of director seats, liquidation preferences, anti-dilution protection, all those things that you can see up on the board there. These, these are the essence of a funding document. And you know, my experience in the U.S. market, where it's a, an evolved capital market, is that these things have become standard. Um, there is negotiation around these items, but no one's trying to reinvent the wheel and waste too much time negotiating these things. There are standard documents for term sheets, as well as for definitive documentation, which the U.S. Venture Capital Association put out, and they're pretty much the template. Um, my strong advice, which is kind of obvious, but just to say it out loud, is to get a good lawyer. They can save you a lot of time, including helping you close quickly, and also minimize dilution and keep control. For all those founders in the room, make sure you keep control of your company. You all read about Mark Zuckerberg and his control of Facebook. I mean, that's obviously incredibly unusual. You should aim for that, though. You started the business. You're growing it. You're the one putting the hard sweat in there. Try to retain control. Not always possible. The market will determine whether you can uh, negotiate that in your uh, fundraising. But um, you don't want to be not in control of your own company. It ultimately might be the, the place that you end up, but, uh, but that's my thought there. Going to the next slide, your funding presentation, I'm not going to run through these. All I'm going to say is just that the simpler your presentation, the better. I see 100-page investment memorandums coming from um, you know, companies trying to raise money in Australia and New Zealand. That may be a regulatory thing, but generally speaking, you know, it's, it's 10 to 12 slides. You know, keep it simple with a, you know, a financial model attached to it, especially at the early stage. You can spend a lot of time making that 100-page investment memorandum, and ultimately the investor wants to look you in the eye and see your conviction about the problem in the market and that you can actually deliver this business. Of course, they do a little more due diligence, but that's the essence of, of the start of a, the, the fundraising business, uh, process. Going to the next slide, um, to my view, the pitch is where you can spend a lot of time you can't spend too much time on this, put it another way. To my mind, you've got about 30 seconds to connect with your investor. He's going to want to hear or she's going to want to hear more about your story, but it's that first 30 seconds that they say, okay, wow, this, this person has something. They've got that conviction. They know what they're doing. They're passionate. They're in this. And so I highly recommend you practice this first part. You know, my company, Group Commerce, is developing an e-commerce technology platform that's going to help media companies struggling with a transition to the digital world to survive and prosper in that world. That's a pretty big problem. It's a global problem. That would be the opening. You've got the, uh, the other stuff in front of you there, the market size, what are the milestones you're trying to achieve or that you have achieved, and why you need the funding. I highly recommend you practice that. Going to the next slide. This is an interesting little eye chart. Um, by a company called Luma here in uh, New York City. They're trying to show how M&A kind of works in the U.S. right now. I mean, some of these companies are global. But right at the bullseye there, you've got the most active and large uh, acquirers. And going out, you've got the different quadrants there, technology, commerce, marketing, and media, and who the companies are in those quadrants that are interested 
in acquiring companies that are going to help them with their digital strategy. My point there is partly because it's an interesting slide to look at because it kind of summarizes how to think about exit strategy if M&A is your chosen route. Um, but also just to say that you know investors want to know how they're going to get their money out. You may not care because you've got a vision to change the world, but they certainly do. Going to the next slide, um, a little bit about the US uh, angel funding market um, and then comparing it to the New Zealand market. Um, about $20 billion invested in 61,000 companies last year in the age stage in the U.S., obviously a very large, incredibly dynamic um, ecosystem. Um, following on from that, about 1,000 companies got $23 billion, so slightly bigger than the, than the early stage. It's interesting to see how vibrant that angel stage is in, in the U.S. market. And, of course, you all read about the, you know, the, the incredible um, sort of growth of the New York tech scene and other areas around the U.S. in addition to the home of technology, Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley gets about 30% of the funding these days. It used to be 70%. 70% of it in the U.S. now coming from other parts of the world, uh, other parts of uh, America. Going to the next slide, you know, I'm, as I'm learning more about the New Zealand venture capital ecosystem, it's really heartening to see what's, what's happening there and, and evolving. I mean, a lot of the logos on the slide you'll, you'll recognize, I'm sure. Um, about $20 million invested in angel seed deals in 67 deals last year, uh, according to NZVIF. Um, but big problem there is that there's not as evolved a VC for, uh, ecosystem for the follow-on rounds, Series A, B, C, and through. Um, that's a hole that needs to be filled, both by the local VC community, but also transitioning New Zealand companies into the, some of the larger markets. Um, you know, NZVIF estimated that there was $200 million a year needed for the follow-on later stage funding. So there's some evolution to, to happen there, but certainly some great uh, progress and, and very exciting. If we move to this next uh, slide here, I want to talk a little bit about scaling a business. Scaling is a funny word. Uh, what does it mean and when, when, does, it, when does it apply? Um, yeah, I'm going through this a little bit with group commerce at the moment. You know, we were two and a half, three years into our business. Uh, we're about 140 staff now. Um, our early technology has evolved into, you know, a pretty solid platform. Um, our team has evolved into some, a team that knows what they're doing. We've got customers that, that really rely on us. Um, but if we're to go from, you know, 20 customers today to 200 customers, uh, we're going to have to reinvent ourselves, uh, both in the way that we communicate internally uh, and also the way that we kind of provide our solution. Um, I like to use the term resetting the table. You know, in, in the first couple of years of your business, you, you just get it done. It's band-aids upon band-aids and a little bit of ingenuity on top. Um, at some point, that just doesn't scale. And so turning your entire customer experience, solution, however you think about your business, upside down and reimagining it is, is what we're doing right now um, and is critical if you want to actually scale. And, and, and also break through the ceiling of being a feature or you know, a small company that ultimately gets acquired early to being a, a large and meaningful global company. Um, you know, every large company you, you can think of has been through this. Um, so that's how I think about scaling. Another, another thing I like to say to my team is um, removing bottlenecks that impede our growth. They exist all over, I'm sure your businesses as in ours, and, and removing them by the technology or better, better uh, processes internally is critical. So um, moving to the next slide, you know, what are world-class operations? I think you know, ultimately underpinned by, by great values, so you're attracting a good team, you need that very strong vision. Uh, you know, I love our vision that we're trying to help media companies survive and prosper in a digital world by participating in these huge trillion-dollar e-commerce markets. Um, a big story is what, is what people get behind, both your team, investors, the media, you, you name it. Um, the DNA of a great company is, is predictability. You, know, you need to understand how your business is operating, which includes um, transparency over you know, information. The more information you give to your team, if they're smart people with good judgment and common sense, they're going to be able to make better decisions. So giving them lots of information is really important. Um, that entrepreneurial environment, which gives way to, you know, a scaling business and the balance of the two types of characters, the wild horses and, and, and the process people, that's a, an interesting uh, kind of contention in any business that's trying to grow up. Um, and you need both. 
Um, skepticism and criticism. I love opinions. You know, I don't know it all in my business. I absolutely need help. I need opinions from people. I need them to challenge what I'm going to say. But I'm going to go forward because you have to make decisions and you have to make progress if you're going to move forward. And, and when someone challenges that, it's very refreshing and it's very valuable. So encouraging that is, is critical, um, which includes, you know, no politics and empires. I mean, these are dirty words in building a business. Um, they go in the bad apples category. Get them out very quickly. Good people don't want to work with politics. I mean, we all know they exist in large companies, but the longer you can keep them away, the better. Um, an experienced board of directors with unbiased views who can really challenge you again. You don't want yes people around you. You know, they're comfortable, but they're not really helpful to making the best mousetrap or whatever it is you're designing. And uh, important as a strong-minded you, you know, entrepreneur to use your ears and your mouth in the same uh, proportion. <laughs> listen. It's very easy to be the one talking. Uh, it's much more valuable to listen to people. And getting visibility and buzz going in any business is, is just critical. Um, whether you want to talk, attract a great team, recruit them out of some great job they've got right now, um, get the investors excited. Um, you know, getting a story going which the, the media is going to really cotton on to is, is, is very important. Um, this next slide about only the paranoid survive, I think um, this is kind of a paranoid slide. But, uh, you know, you've only got so much capital, you've only got so much time, you've only got so much credibility and, and only, only so many brownie points with, with your clients and so on. You better darn well make sure that you're learning as you go. You better measure everything. You better constantly challenge the, the, the what, what is good, um, continuous improvement, under, making sure everyone on your team understands the top three metrics in the company. I mean, there are many metrics that are important, but if you walk past anyone in, in the corridor and ask them, you know, what's our best metric, what's, our, what's the metric we're focused on here at this company, they should be able to answer it because everything is in the metrics. And in the early days, of course, you don't have many metrics. It's all gut feel and qualitative feedback. But as soon as you actually have data, I mean, you've got to treasure that. Um, yeah, there's no such thing as a one-quarter problem. Oh, we had a surprise this quarter. Well, you weren't watching the business closely enough if that was the case. So I think you get the, get the point there. Um, the next part I'm going to talk about go, going global. You know, this is about being a startup in New Zealand and, and going global. Um, as you, I'm probably, you can probably hear, I believe this is very possible for all of you in the room and the green fields of not just the New Zealand technology markets but the global markets beckon. Um, how to do it? I think um, going to this first picture here, um, you know, sometimes the thought of going global can feel a, a little bit like that. It's a bit daunting. Um, but with the right product, the right approach, uh, there's absolutely no reason you, you can't do that. Um, you know, when thinking of New Zealand, it's just an island that sits off, off of New York and, and uh, San Fran, with respect to technology, that is, or off of London or wh whichever your market is. It's very close. Um, and, and the people in, in offshore markets, they have their needs, just like you and I, um, and that they want to talk to smart people who have solutions. So, you know, going to the next slide, you know, I, I took a quick look at kind of um, GDP size in smaller countries, under $10 million, uh, 10 million in population. Sweden was the, the biggest population. I looked at most of these are sort of 5 to 6 million, 7 million in the case of Israel. Um, you know, these are pretty evolved Western economies. Uh, they've got a lot of industries other than technology. Um, a total of about a trillion and a half of GDP. And about 10% of that is currently technology. Um, by my calculation, New Zealand's in with about 4% at the moment, which is pretty good. I believe, I, I believe it might be the second largest uh, contributor in terms of export dollars now, recently overtaking, maybe it was tourism. Um, but there's a long way to go, and there's just a huge opportunity there. And, and so, you know, that's the point of, of, that, of that slide. You know, in some of these, these Nordic countries, I mean, we're all familiar with the, the Nokia's, and the Ericsson's and so on. We're also familiar with their struggles recently. I mean, that's, that's the curse of being a big company and being too bureaucratic and political and not being able to move quickly. But, you know, they are still huge success stories for their, uh, for their economies and for their countries. But on that slide there, you can see a few new logos. 
Spotify out of Denmark, Rovio, MySQL, Checkpoint out of Israel. I mean, these are meaningful newer companies, just like Vend and Carnival Labs, and there's a bunch of other logos from people sitting in the room right there, which could be there. I, lo I love Israel's story. It's a 7 million population country. Um, they have more companies on NASDAQ than any foreign country except for China. And China only recently passed them. And they know how to do business internationally. And they have an incredible tech uh, you know, ecosystem going on there. That is in part driven by their military, their military and their need to protect themselves, which, of course, we don't suffer from or have to worry about as much in New Zealand. Uh, but it just goes to show you know, a population of 7 million can produce some pretty incredible technology. Um, so moving to the next slide and opportunities for New Zealand, I mean, I think I talked about the markets out there and, and the problems that might exist, and I'm sure some of you in the room are solving those. Um, but what I think is a real opportunity to help you all is a platform that's going to help you go global. I think the evolving ecosystem to get you started in New Zealand is, is, is really on the right track. But how do you make that step into some of these international markets and not feel daunted? Um, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment, but you know, I believe it is uh, a combination of the private sector and the public sector. It is led by the private sector, um, but the public sector can play a very important supporting role there. I think skills and leadership is, is, is a, a real need. Um, it, it exists in, in all countries right now. There was an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about Microsoft and its problems trying to get uh, tech workers uh, here in the U.S. Um, you know, we, we've have a good emerging technology kind of education system and, and, and output of software engineers in New Zealand, but you know, we need more of those. And, and, and they need to be uh, taught how to lead larger technology organizations. I believe that we could have a program of allowing new, uh, engineering leadership from countries like the US or Israel or Europe to spend a few years in New Zealand. Uh, I, I know a lot of technology leaders who'd love to do that. Um, but, of course, it's hard to just get a working visa and head down to New Zealand. I think the government could play a strong role in supporting that. Um, incentives for incubators and tech investors. I think there's a lot of good stuff going on around that. Um, but, yeah, education, leadership and skills. And last but not least, appeal. You know, I remember when I was at Otago University, it seemed like everyone was doing finance, law, marketing or accounting. I mean, you know, those are important parts of the economy, but really what about the creation of new businesses and what about the technology sector? They just, it just didn't register back in those days. Admittedly, it was a few years ago. It's probably changed somewhat since I was at university in the, in the, in the early 90s. Um, but this is the career path for young people. And technology entrepreneurship should be celebrated, idolized, if you like, in, in New Zealand, because that's how we're going to attract the best people. So going to the next slide, please. Um, Here's a common sense approach to when you're ready to go global. Um, firstly, where should you spend your time? I mean, it's, part, it's kind of the same story for when you're raising uh, capital. You should be spending your time on your market, the problem, building a team. And in the case of going global, you're going to need some cash. So spend your time on that. Spend as little time as possible on things like legal and finance, VC interactions, visas, contracts, stock options. You know, there are services companies that exist in Silicon Valley, New York, that can help you a lot with this stuff, sort of chaperone you through it. And, you know, I've, I've worked with a few of them, and, and they'll be very helpful. But, you know, not spending too much time working on that is, is one thing. Um, the second thing is that when you head to a new market, you need to find an experienced sales professional or a business development professional who has all of the contacts. This person's going to cost you money. It'll be your, your most expensive hire. And you can accompany them to tell customers your vision um, and help with the sales process. But you know, doing it all on your own self is, is really going to waste a lot of time. So I would encourage you to invest in, in a top business development or salesperson to help you navigate initial customers because case studies and, and, and getting that initial local team is what's going to give you credibility. And on the back of credibility, good things happen. Momentum. The first question you'll get asked by any U.S. VC is, who are your U.S. customers? The first question you'll get asked by a U.S. customer is, who are your other U.S. customers? So, you know, sweetheart deals for those initial customers to enable you to put their logos on your uh, presentation materials, to act as references for you, et cetera, 
is is a surefire way to get your business started. And so, you know, back to what what you know the platform idea I was talking about before. You know, having um, a well worn path and support for these you know things you shouldn't be doing as much of is is something I think that the private and public sector can spend a lot more time on. There there are some you know incubators and landing pads and Kia's doing some stuff and so is Trade Ends and others in you know uh, San Fran which are, is great to see but. You know, an entrepreneur that arrives in New York or, or uh, San Fran and says, I, how do I get a stock option program going? And how do I um, get some visas? And where are the VCs? I mean, these are questions which should be already answered for them. So, you know, th there's just a few thoughts on that. I want to go to the next slide here. There's a few photos of some pretty interesting looking characters. You may recognize some of them. Uh, they, 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 they sort of look from a, another era almost, don't they? Um, there's, there's a new crop of these kind of characters uh, in the room right now. Um, and, and they, like the people on the, sli on the slide here, are going to experience that uh, squiggly line. And with tenacity and determination, like the people on the slide, they're going to survive some hardships and they're going to make it through and they're going to ultimately be successful, just like the people on, on these slides here. If you don't recognize the people up the right, the Microsoft early team, uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak on the bottom right, and, and obviously the Google guys on the bottom left there. Um, so going to the last slide here, um, I just want to highlight again that economies are made of many sectors. Uh, they're all important, but right now, you know, the fastest growing large economy and sector in the world is the technology sector. That's where New Zealand needs to spend its attention. Uh, we truly can participate. Our people uh, have the right mindset. We don't suffer from the tyranny of distance. And that's going to be driven by the private sector, but with a strong supporting role from the public sector. Uh, I want to say to all of you entrepreneurs in the room, would you please stand up? All people in the room, please stand up who are entrepreneurs. You guys are doing a great thing. Um, congratulations to you. Um, keep it up. To the investors that are supporting them, Keep, keep it up too. You guys are putting your money where your mouth is. It's very hard to invest in early stage businesses and congratulations to, the, to you for doing that. And when you all speak to people, young people, you should tell them that being a technology entrepreneur and working in the technology industry is a sure-fired career that they should proceed with because they can win just like you can and I truly believe that you guys can take your companies global. So thank you very much for your time privilege to be talking to you and, and good luck with your businesses. I think we're going to do a few questions now. John Z, that was absolutely outstanding. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're going to have a couple of roving mics around to uh, ask a couple of questions. Just while they, they're being passed around the room, John D, I'll, I'll kick off with a, with a first question for you. Um, obviously, we, we had a, a large number of the people in this room stand up when you asked who, who are the entrepreneurs in the room. And obviously, these people are, are starting up their businesses today and, and doing great things. But to be a global company, can they still be based here or do they have to be offshore? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've been thinking about that. I can't say I've, I've solved it yet um, because obviously you want to keep the goodness in New Zealand. I'm a patriotic New Zealander. I would like to be able to do as much of that if I, as I could if I was uh, having a business in New Zealand and like you, wanting to expand globally. Um, I believe that it can be done if the you know, technology leadership and depth of engineering talent is developed in New Zealand. Uh, that will make the headquarters of New Zealand and the development center of New Zealand and the IP for that matter and the brains and the whole ecosystem has got to remain there, and that will be underpinned by the, the technologists. The business people that support them, who may also be technologists, are going to be very important to helping take the company global, which is more about sales and marketing. But the actual product development and, and the building of the technology, um, it needs to stay in New Zealand, and, and that's going to need a, a deeper and more developed ecosystem. But if that is there, I believe that um, New Zealand companies can be global and be significantly based in New Zealand, which will, of course, flow many benefits back to New Zealand 
Uh, and of course they're going to need teams in, in other markets as well. But keeping as much of that back in New Zealand is, is obviously the goal there. So I, I do believe it can be done, but you know, there's evolution to happen there. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you. Okay, we have our first question. Yep. I'll, I'll repeat it too if you can't hear it, John D. Mic on? No, oh, mic's on now. Good, thank you. Right, so a couple of questions, I guess, is we're starting up in the US at the moment. And from a techno access to people from a technology point of view and not blowing the cost out of the water in the US, where would you base a small team of people, you know, the two to half a dozen in the US? And can you do it virtually or are you better off having that team in one place so you build that team culture? Hmm. So first, second question first. Um, I think early stage, it, it's more challenging, obviously, to have... Um, your team spread out remotely, trying to interact through Skype, different time zones, all of that stuff. Being able to stand up in a room, look each other in the eye, work through problems uh, person to person is obviously far more effective. So I would always err towards that in the early days. But, you know, spreading the team out, outsourcing, putting people in, in different markets uh, once you get going is, is something that you should build into your company as a capability. Uh, you know, we're actually you know, building that as a capability in New York right now. We've got a, you know, about 30 engineers sitting in downtown New York City and we're, we're actually just starting to outsource into Buenos Aires. We evaluated uh, I think eight or nine different outsourcing centers around the world. They all have their pros and cons which bas basically go with the um, dynamics of quality and cost. You know. Um, but so that's the first point. I, you know, in terms of basing in, you, in the U.S., um, you know, you will get easier access to technology talent at a lower cost if you avoid New York City, uh, the Boston area, and Silicon Valley, um, and go to places like well, and Seattle, because of course that's where Microsoft is, is based. I mean, Colorado is becoming a popular spot. Um, places in Canada, um, which is obviously just across the border. Um, North Carolina, seeing some companies out of there, Philadelphia. Um, yeah, just avoiding New York City and uh, the West Coast and Seattle would be one way to do it. But, of course, then you are out of the impact zone. Uh, there's something about being, you know, right in the thick of the flow and what's going on. And, uh, you know, so there's pros and cons to that. But, yeah, it is a, it is a real challenge. Um, technology salaries go up. Uh, there's a highest paid people in most countries on an average uh, companies on an average basis and um, yeah it's a, it's a tough decision to, to go either way there's pros and cons one more microphone over here please we've got time just, just for this one last question Yeah, um, just with your point uh, with VCs, um, outsourcing, marketing, etc. at what point would you introduce that when you're starting a new business? And how much of your own money do you actually use before you start looking at VCs, etc.? Well, the second question first again. I mean, as I mentioned before, bootstrapping as long as you can is going to instill discipline. And importantly, you know, you... You need to get a proof of concept before you go to the market to raise money. Um, it's really hard to fund an idea that's just a PowerPoint presentation with not much behind it. Um, so I would use your own money as long as possible, otherwise known as bootstrapping, because it instills, instills discipline um, and minimizes dilution. Um, in terms of your question about outsourcing, I'm not sure you can outsource to VCs, but the VC part of it, but certainly working with... Um, if you're going to go global, a professional in the sales and marketing area that's relevant to your business and the audience you're trying to reach is, is imperative, and that will cost you money, but it will pay handsome dividends. And, you know, working with a services company who can help make introductions to VCs, it's not raising the money from the VCs, it's simply helping introductions. Um, an accounting firm which has legal built in um, can be very helpful. Um, but you know, raising money is still going to be a, a you know a lot of your own effort. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. 
Thank you, Dante. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dante Kelp from our group Congress. Thanks very much.